Welcome to this presentation on stochastic digital backpropagation. This presentation was first given at a special symposium, Machine Learning Concepts in Optical Communication Systems, at SPPCOM 2014 in San Diego. My name is Henk Weimersch, and I'm with the Fiber Optic Communication Research Center at Chalmers University of Technology. This work is based on joint research with Naga Vishnukant, Irukulapati, Erika Grell, and Pontus Johannesson, all from Chalmers. This is the outline of the presentation. I will start by briefly reviewing the MAP criterion and then describing how digital backpropagation is not MAP. We will then dig into the machine learning toolbox and look at appropriate tools to connect digital backpropagation with MAP. The resulting algorithm is called stochastic digital backpropagation. We'll provide some numerical results and finally an outlook. First of all, the MAP criterion. Our goal is to determine an unknown x when observing y. So in the context of communication, y could be an oversampled signal and x could be a sequence of bits. We are given a model py of x, this is called a likelihood function, and a prior p of x. Our optimality criterion is to minimize the probability of making an error, which in many cases is a very meaningful criterion especially in the case of digital communications. It turns out that a detector that minimizes the probability of making an error is the MAP detector, given by this expression. This expression should be interpreted as follows. For a given y, a given observation, the optimal estimate of x, x hat of y, is found by taking the posterior distribution p of x given y, in which x is a free variable and y is frozen, and finding the mode of this distribution. This is given by the arc max operation. In some cases, x is a very long vector and the maximization is computationally intractable. In that case, we can go for the marginal map detector, in which case we are looking for the optimal estimates of the individual components in x, say xi. So in this case, the estimate of xi given the entire observation y denoted by xi hat of y, is found by taking the mode of the marginal posterior p of xi given y. To visualize this, here I show a posterior distribution p of x given y, where the argument here is x on the x-axis. So we show p of x given y for different possible values of x, and the value of x that corresponds to the mode is here x hat of y. So this is the map estimate of x given y. There are some challenges related to the map detector. First of all, a prior is needed. Now in the case of communications, this is easy because we know the distribution over all possible inputs because we generate the inputs ourselves. Secondly, a likelihood function is needed, p of y given x, because combined with the prior, this gives rise to the posterior. And in the case of optical communication, this is the a key challenge to find a good model and thus a good likelihood function. And finally, the complexity can be very high, because even if the likelihood and the prior are known, either the evaluation of the maximization can be hard, or determining p of x given y in closed form can be hard. So now we move from the MAP criterion to optical communications and the digital backpropagation algorithm. We know that propagation in optical fiber can be described through the Monakoff equation, which is given here for illustration purposes. The Monakoff equation contains both space, z, time, t, dispersion, nonlinearity, and propagation losses. Now consider an optical transmission system with a transmitter, a receiver, and in between n spans of fiber and these spans of fiber are separated by amplifiers. Now to model how the propagation goes in the fiber through the Manakov equation, we can do this numerically by dividing up the fiber into many small segments. Each of these segments 
that is governed by a nonlinear component, essentially a rotation, and a linear component, dispersion. Each of these two operations are invertible. And if we make the number of segments long enough or each segment short enough, this gives rise to a very good approximation of the Manikov equation. Since each segment is invertible, we can exploit this knowledge at the receiver. And this is termed digital backpropagation. This is a figure taken from this paper by Ipen Khan, visualizing this approach. So in the first row, A, we have the clean light going from the transmitter to the receiver through analog forward propagation governed by the Manakov equation. So in the end, we have the light that the receiver observes. Now, if the Manakov equation exactly describes this transmission system, so basically ignoring the noise in the amplifiers, we can take the dirty light that is seen by the receiver and invert the forward system digitally, so in the digital signal processing. And by doing this, what we get in the end is again the clean light that was originally transmitted. Note, however, that digital backpropagation does not account for the noise added in the amplifiers. So by definition, digital backpropagation is not necessarily equivalent to MAP, so to maximum a posterior detection, so as a consequence, digital backpropagation is not necessarily the optimal thing to do. Here is an illustrative example of the performance of digital backpropagation taken from this paper. On the x-axis, I show the optical signal-to-noise ratio, on the y-axis the bit error rate. And again, bit error rate is the final, the final criterion of interest. While there are many curves on this figure, we highlight the blue curve which is called linear compensation, so which corresponds to just compensating for the linear impairments of the fiber, ignoring nonlinearity. And compare this to the orange curve, which is digital backpropagation, and we see significant performance gains. The excellent performance of digital backpropagation has led to two important research tracks. On the one hand, a very large research track dealing with how to reduce the complexity of digital backpropagation. For instance, by reducing the number of segments per span in the backward phase. A second, much smaller track has dealt with how to account for noise. And the dominant technique here was to use learning, which I will illustrate in the next slide. The learning approach works as follows. We have again the same transmission system as before. And in our receiver, we have a standard compensation algorithm. This could be digital backpropagation, but it could also be a more simple linear compensation algorithm. In either case, at the output of the algorithm, we still have residual memory and residual nonlinear effects, which are not known in closed form. We can then apply a Viterbi algorithm on a suitable trellis to make final optimal decisions. However, to make these decisions, we need to know the, tr the transition costs of the trellis. So how we learn these transition costs is by sending lots of training data from the transmitter to the receiver. And if we have all possible transitions that can occur, we can learn the cost of each transition. Once this learning has been completed, we uh, commence with actual data transmission, so of data unknown to the receiver. So some recent work has shown the benefit of this. So in this figure, on the x-axis, we have transmission power, on the y-axis, the bit error rate. And the curves to look out for are the black one, which is traditional digital backpropagation, and the blue one, which is digital backpropagation, followed by a Viterbi algorithm combined with learning. And we see, again, considerable performance gains. However, a drawback of this approach is that we need to send a lot of training data and we don't make fact of the noise that we have an explicit model of the entire system. However, this explicit model is not in a closed form. So now we dig into the machine learning toolbox and see which other tools are available to us to bring digital backpropagation and maxima posterior detection closer. One of the most well-known books in machine learning is this book here shown on the right. And if you go through the chapters on this of this book, you find more or less the following. So these are a number of machine learning tools, calcium processes, which I often use for regression, support vector machines for classification, 
neural networks, graphical models and dynamic programming, expectation maximization and mixture models, Monte Carlo methods, and principal component analysis. Now it turns out that many of these tools have already been used in the optics community. So for instance, principal component analysis has been used for performance monitoring, Monte Carlo methods for computation of information rates, expectation maximization for nonlinearity compensation, graphical models and dynamic programming also for nonlinearity compensation, neural networks for identifying modulation formats, support vector machi machines also for nonlinearity compensation. And it turns out that I could not find any work in optics that used Gaussian processes. So perhaps there's a, a research opportunity there. Now, if you were to look in the wireless communication world, it turns out that the most dominant tool among all these tools is graphical models. In fact, it turns out that many well-known algorithms in communications and signal processing can be cast as special cases of graphical models. These include the Viterbi algorithm, the BCGR algorithm, and various decoding techniques. So perhaps it is time to apply this powerful tool to optical communications. So what I will do in the next four slides is to present a mini tutorial of one graphical model, namely factor graphs. Factor graphs are a graphical representation of a factorization of a function. So consider here a function of four variables, which factorizes into three factors, and each of these factors has as argument a subset of the variables. We will now draw a graphical model, in particular a factor graph, of this factorization. We first of all see that there are three factors, so in the factor graph we, we draw three factor vertices. There are four variables, so we draw four variable vertices. And I label them with the corresponding variable. Now if you look at a certain variable, say x1, x1 appears in fa, fb, and fc. So to illustrate this in the factor graph, I will draw edges or lines between the variable vertex x1 and the factor vertices fa, fb, fc. I do the same for x2, x3, and x4. So this is how you draw a factor graph of a factorization of a function. Second part of factor graphs is message passing. On a factor graph, you can execute a number of message passing algorithms. One of those message passing algorithms is called belief propagation or the sum product algorithm. One way to visualize this is to see the factor, the vertices as computers and the edges as communication links. The messages are then packets that are sent over these communication links and combined in the computers. The messages have the following data structure. The message from fa to x1 is a function of x1. The message from x1 to fa is a function of x1. So both messages are functions of the same variable. So if the variable x1 is a binary variable, a message would be just a vector of length 2 the function evaluated in 0 and the function evaluated in 1. If x1 is a continuous variable, then the function can have an arbitrary shape. A way to interpret the message is as follows. The message, for instance, from fc to x1 is describing everything I know about x1 given the right part of the factor graph. The message from x1 to fc is everything I know about x1 given the left part of the factor graph. So combined, they tell me everything I know about x1. And this will become more concrete in a bit. Now, after I've computed all the message, I can look at a certain variable, say x1, and a certain edge connected to this variable, like this one, and investigate the two messages. So if x3 here is a continuous variable, this could be a message. So this could be the message from x3 to fc, so the upward message. The downward message could look like this. Now it turns out that if you multiply both of these messages, and this is possible because they're defined over the same variable, you recover the marginal of the variable, so the marginal of x3. We recall that the marginal of a function with respect to a certain variable is just obtained by taking the function and summing out all of the variables except the one of interest. 
So what you end up with after this operation is a function of x3. This is by definition the marginal of x3. So now I've said how you draw a factor graph and what the messages are. I haven't told you how to compute the messages. So the messages according to the sum product algorithm, which is just one of the message passing algorithms you can run on a factor graph, is given by the following equations. Mu here denotes message, so the message from variable vertex x1 to factor vertex fc, which is a function of the variable x1, so I can evaluate it for every possible value x1 can take. So this message in the factor graph is from x1 to fc, so it's this, this one here to the right. It's given by the product of all the incoming messages, so it's the product of the message from fa to x1, so that's the first one evaluated in the same value of x1, multiplied by the message from fb to x1, evaluated in the same value that x1 takes. So I can do this operation for every possible value of x1, and I get a new function of x1, which is this message. The message from a factor vertex to a variable vertex, for instance from fc to x1, so the leftward message here, is a function of x1, and is obtained by taking the product of the two incoming messages, so from x3 to fc, from F x4 to fc, multiplying those. Note that these are defined over different domains. You then multiply it with the factor itself, so fc, and you sum out all of the variables except x1. And then of course you end up with a function of x1, and this is the message. Now if you apply this algorithm over this graph, in the end, once all the messages has been, have been computed, you can recover the marginal of any variable you want, say of x3, by just taking the product of the two messages over the corresponding edge. So for instance, if you want to recover the marginal of x4, you just multiply those two messages. If you want to recover the marginal of x1, you take any of the edges and just multiply the two messages. Again, the hardest part to understand is that the messages are functions. So if a variable is binary, if x1 is binary, this could be a visualization of a message. And in a computer, this, in a computer, this can be represented by a vector of length 2. If a variable is continuous, this could be a message. And this, of course, is much harder to represent in a computer. Possible ways to represent a message is, first of all, to quantize the domain and then evaluate the message in those points this gives rise to a vector, which is an approximation of the message. A second, a second way to represent the message is by considering it to be a mixture of well-known distributions, such as Gaussians. So we here we fit the message to a mixture of two Gaussians, and now the message can be described by two means, two covariances, and a weight. A third way to represent the message is by drawing lots of samples from the corresponding message. So a message can often be considered as a scaled distribution, so by drawing lots of samples from this distribution, we have a good representation of this message. This latter representation is important. In many practical applications, messages are often normalized and transformed, and this leads, for example, to the well-known log-likelihood ratio representation often used in decoding. We should also note that when the graph has cycles, so for instance, if there's an edge between x2 and fa, the message passing algorithm, in this case the sum product algorithm, can fail and give rise to incorrect results. A way to understand this is as follows. Remember that I said that the message from fa to x1 tells you everything I know about x1 given the left part of the graph. Now, if there's an edge between fa and x2, there is really no left part of the graph because the left part of the graph and the right part of the graph are connected. So in this case, it does not make sense to multiply the messages to find the marginal because you, you overuse information. This is a Intuitive imp interpretation as to why the sum product algorithm can fail when the graph has cycles. Now let's look at two interesting functions, interesting at least from the point of view of digital backpropagation. First of all, suppose that in your factor graph you have two variables that are related through an invertible function. So here the two variables are y and x, and the function is phi of x. 
So this will be the factor graph relation here. The variable x, the variable y, and the invertible relationship between x and y. So this here is a delta direct function. So now suppose that we have the message here available in particle format, so from right to left, and we want to compute the message in particle format here. In the second example, we have the same variables x and y, where y is related y with x through the addition of Gaussian noise. And here n is a Gaussian random variable, 0 mean variance sigma squared. So now in the factor graph, this relation can be represented as follows. We have again the variables x and y, and the function here connecting them is just a Gaussian distribution. I've removed the normalization constant of this Gaussian because it is irrelevant. And again, we assume that we have a particle representation here, going from right to left about y, and we want to compute a particle representation here, again going from right to left. Let's go back to our first example. Here I depict the particle representation regarding the message from right to left about y. So these different bars represent the different particles, corresponding to different values of y. Now to obtain the particle representation here of the message on x, what I do is I take a certain particle, let's call it yk, and I apply the inverse function, phi inverse to yk, and I get a new particle in the x domain xk. I do this for each of the particles, so in this case there are six particles, and I obtain six particles that represent the message on x. So now let's go to the second example. Assume I have a particle representation, representation about y, so here I have a number of particles that represent this message. Now x and y are related to addition of noise, so in order to recover a particle representation of x, what I do is I take a particle of y and I subtract noise with the appropriate variance, sigma squared. Of course, subtracting noise or adding noise is the same thing, so I can just as well add noise with the correct variance, and then I get a particle of x. I do this for each of the particles, so then I have a number of particles that represent the message here going from y to left about x. Now it may seem counterintuitive that the uncertainty here is higher than the uncertainty here. So the spread of the particles is higher. However, consider the following example to explain this. Suppose I know y exactly. In this case, I would have only one particle, or I would have a number of particles that coincide. Now, to represent what I know about x, I will always have more uncertainty about x than I have about y, because x and y are related to the addition of Gaussian noise. So even if I know y perfectly, there will always be more spread in the particles of y. And the same effect is shown here in the bottom. So now we know a little bit more about factor graphs and how they, the messages are implemented. Let's look at a complete example associated with digital communication. So suppose I have a communication system where I transmit a sequence of bits, say a thousand bits. I repeat every bit twice, so just to provide some error correcting capabilities. Then I modulate using BPSK, so binary phase shift keying. So then here I have a sequence of plus and minus ones. I add IID noise, so this is a sequence of 2000 noise samples, and this gives me an observation Y of length 2000 of real numbers. Now in order to recover B from Y, the optimal thing to do is to find the map estimate of B given by taking the posterior distribution, and again here Y is fixed, Y is observed, plugging in every possible value of B and then taking the mode of this distribution. Now, in this case, because B is of length 1000, there's far too many combinations to try out. So instead of going for the optimal sequence detection, we go for optimal bit detection. So in this case, we care about the marginal posteriors, and then we just plug in 0 and 1 here, and then we find the decision on the kth bit. And we compute this marginal posterior for each of the 1000 bits, and this gives us 1000 decisions, one for each bit. Now, to compute these marginal posteriors, we rely on factor graphs. 
So what we do is we take the joint distribution, we factorize it, so according to Bayes' rule, the joint distribution is the prior times the likelihood. The prior, assuming the bits are independent, the prior factorizes the product of the priors of the individual bits. And now for each transmitted bit, we have two observations. So this gives rise to two likelihood functions here. Now this is a factorization of a function. The variables are the b's, the y's are observed, so they're not variables. But I can draw now a factor graph of this factorization. The factor graph will look like this. So I draw a variable vertex, b1 through bn, in this case n is 1000, marked here in blue. For each bit I have a prior, here in green, and this is the same as this factor here. And for each bit I have two likelihood functions marked in orange. And as you can see here, there are basically factor graphs associated with each bit, and these factor graphs are disjoint. So now if we want to make a decision on the first bit, what do we do? We take the message here, which corresponds to evaluating the likelihood function associated with the first observation in 0 and 1. This gives me this message. I then take the second observation and evaluate the likelihood function, which gives me this message, just as an example. I apply the sum product algorithm, so in this case the upward message here is just the product of those two messages, visualized here. And now, in case the prior is uniform, then this message here is also the posterior, or a scaled version of this. And this allows me to make an optimal decision on the first bit. So in this case, the first bit, the optimal decision of the first bit would be zero. All right, so now we spent four slides on factor graphs. Let's go back to our optical communication system. So here we have an optical communication system where at the input we have a sequence of QAM symbols, S. We have a transmitter, which is just here a pulse shaping. This gives me a signal X of T. And this is passed through the fiber optical trans transmission system comprising single mode fiber and fiber bright grading. So without going into too much detail, the single mode fiber creates nonlinear effects and dispersion. And the fiber bright grading aims to compensate for the dispersion in the optical domain. After the fiber bright grading, I have an EDFA. So this is an, an amplifier, which adds noise. And this gives rise to my observed signal, R of T. And now I want to develop an appropriate receiver algorithm to make optimal decisions. And of course, in practice, I will have many of these fiber spans concatenated. So let's first look at the transmitted signal. So the transmitted signal will look something like this. Here I assume it's a real signal. The received signal, after passing through the optical system, is affected by nonlinearity, by noise, and by, lin by linear dispersion. So the received signal could look something like this, again, visualizing just the real part. Now the receiver only knows R of T. It does not know any of the intermediate signals or the transmitted symbols. However, the receiver knows the relationship between X and Y, between Y and Z, and between Z and R. So now we can use factor graphs to exploit this relationship. The way that we do this is we take the joint distribution of all the variables, so the transmitted symbols, the received signal, and all the intermediate variables. So in case you have many segments per fiber, you would have intermediate, many intermediate variables per fiber span. Um, we write continuous time signals in a vector notation, so this could be an oversampled version of the signal. And then we factorize this joint distribution. Now because we have a Markov chain, we can factorize this distribution comprising the prior then a bunch of factors containing just two variables, and then finally a likelihood function containing the observation. And we now draw a factor graph of this factorization. So the factor graph could look something like this. For the sake of illustration, I have added the observation explicitly. This is not strictly needed. So we have the prior, the different factors, and then in colors, I denote here the different variables, including the intermediate variables. So none of these variables are known to the receiver. The only thing that's known to the receiver is R, the received signal, and then the structure of this factorization. 
So now we apply the stone product algorithm as we've seen before. We first have the message here from R to this function. So since we know R here on top, this message in particle format is just a number of duplicates of this signal. So we have, for instance, 100 duplicates of this signal. This comprises a particle representation of this message. So it's important to note that this variable is a very high dimensional variable since it's an oversampled signal. So each particle itself is a signal, an entire oversampled waveform. So now R and Z are related through an amplification and the addition of noise. So using the rules that we've seen in the previous slides, we can compute this message here by just taking the particle, each of the particles, and adding the appropriate amount of noise and scaling. So then the particle representation of the variable Z could look something like this. So again, you should interpret this as the uncertainty we have of the intermediate state Z. Each of the particles is a waveform, and I've superimposed all of these particles here. Now we, we know the relationship between Y and Z, because this is just a concatenation of linear and nonlinear elements. So using this relation, I can find a particle representation of Y by just taking each of the particles associated with Z and applying the inverse relation through digital backpropagation. So this gives me a number of particles here associated with Y. So then we apply the same technique to find a particle representation of the variable X. So this corresponds to the signal here. Now we note that traditional digital backpropagation operates in a very similar manner. The only difference is that you just have one particle and you don't add noise. So now we have a particle representation of the variable x corresponding to this signal here right after pulse shaping. So now we recover the transmitted QAM symbols as follows. We first apply a match filter and perform symbol rate sampling. So here we have the particle representation of the signal x of t. For each of the particles, so each of the waveforms, we apply a match filter and we sample at the symbol rate. And if we look at a certain symbol slot, what we would see is something like this. So we have the 16 QAM constellation points and then a number of samples or low dimensional particles representing the uncertainty at that symbol slot. Then we can make symbol by symbol decisions as follows. We have each of the 16 possible transmitted symbols. We smoothen the particle cloud, for example, with a Gaussian distribution. And then we evaluate this Gaussian distribution in each of the possible transmitted symbols. So for each of the 16 trans transmitted symbols, I can compute a probability. And then the decision I make is a symbol that gives rise to the maximum probability. I should point out that both steps, so the match filter followed by symbol rate sampling on the one hand, and on the other hand, the symbol by symbol decisions are at this stage both heuristics and they are performed for compu computational complexity reasons. So the final performance we will get is still not the optimal performance that will be given by a true map detector. But in any case, let's see what kind of numerical results we can get by applying this algorithm to a realistic optical communication system. The fiber and the fiber Bragg rating are provided here. On the horizontal axis, I show the input power to the fiber system. On the y-axis, the symbol error rate. And I show results for two distinct cases, a lower rate case with 44 spans of fiber and a higher rate case with 42 spans of fiber. The blue curves correspond to digital backpropagation and the black curves to stochastic digital backpropagation. In both cases, we see significant gains from going to digital backpropagations to stochastic digital backpropagation. At the very low input powers, both algorithms behave the same, but as the nonlinear signal and noise interaction becomes more important, stochastic digital backpropagation has a significant advantage over traditional digital backpropagation. At very high input powers, the nonlinear signal and noise interaction causes the symbol error rate to go up again.
So now that we've described stochastic digital backpropagation and provided some numerical results, let's look at an outlook for the future. So in this presentation, we've shown that machine learning has many opportunities in optical communication systems. And that when you perform machine learning with system-specific knowledge, you can reap advantages. One of the popular tools in machine learning is graphical models, which is largely unexplored in the optics community. Here we provided one example of the application of graphical models to one of the important problems in optical communication. And this led to an algorithm called stochastic digital backpropagation. Now one question you may ask yourself, because we had to apply a number of heuristics, is do we now have a map detector or can we still do better? I will provide a partial answer below. Here I show for a typical optical communication system the symbol error rate versus input power for different algorithms. So the first one is digital backpropagation, the second one stochastic digital backpropagation, which was described in this talk and gives rise to improved performance around 0 dBm input power. Now by removing some of the heuristics and replacing them with more rigorous algorithms, Together with our colleagues from Italy, we were able to achieve even improved performance, resulting to over an order of magnitude performance improvement compared to stochastic digital backpropagation. More details about these results will be published in 2015. Thank you for your attention.